Welcome back to the department one, people versus Robert Durst. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesnoff, Mr. Darren, we have Mr. Henderson, council table, and also Mr. Milius, Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Lewin. And uh, before we go forward, uh, all our jur all jurors and alternates are, are present. So I, I did want to give a, a, a brief instruction to you uh, in, at this point in Mr. Chabin's testimony. Uh, I want the jurors to understand there is nothing illegal, unethical, or improper about attorneys attempting to speak to witnesses before their testimony. That's because the attorney should anticipate testimony and prepare for it. So with that, you may uh, continue, Mr. Henderson, playing the conditional exam. Your Honor, we left off yesterday at 3 hours, 46 minutes, 58 seconds. That was page 208 of the transcript. We've gone back about 20 seconds. There's about two and a half hours left in the video. Do you recall after you were contacted, do you recall after you were contacted uh, by Mr. Durst, did you pick up the phone and contact myself or Detective Shanley and let us know what had happened? I think I did, yes. And Mr. Chapin, during some of these calls with Mr. Durst, is it fair to say that you hid the fact that you had spoken to us? Well, just because you don't say something doesn't mean you're hiding it. Uh... Well, would you agree, Mr. Chapin, that you did not want Mr. Durst to realize that you were cooperating with us. Yes, 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 that's correct. Just wait until the question is finished. Okay. Before you shoot for free. The next day, did you receive another call from Mr. Durst on April 9, 2015? 16, excuse me. It's possible I don't recall. All right, let's this, this day. This refreshing By the way, did you recognize? Was that your voice and Mr. Durst's voice on the last uh, Oh, yes. This is going to be um, NC-209. This is going to be 4916-1915 jail call, page 5, lines 18 through 21. Oh, California. And I still forget, and besides reminding me 27 times, tell you everything you and I say on the phone is listened to. Right. Do you recall Mr. Durst telling you that he was aware that the calls were being monitored? Yes, yes, on several occasions. Right. I want to ask you for a moment, uh, when I say Stuart and Emily Altman, Stuart is spelled S-T-W-A-R-T. Do you know who Stuart and Emily Altman are? Yes, I do. And who do you know Stuart Altman to be? I know him to be a friend of uh, Bob Durst, who was introduced to me by Bob, and to be an attorney in labor relations matters. Have you ever known Stuart to be Bob Durst's lawyer? I believe so, though I didn't know the particulars. Have you known him to be Bob Durst's lawyer in any criminal matters? No. Um, do you know from Bob Durst, does the relationship with Stuart Altman go back to high school? I, I know it goes far back in his life, but I don't know exactly how far. And is Emily, is that uh, Stuart's wife? Yes, she is. And ha have you met both of them? Yes, I have. And if I were to ask you, based on your knowledge and observations and conversations with Mr. Durst, how close of a friend is Stuart Altman to Mr. Durst? I assume they were very close friends. When you say you were, you assume, has Mr. Durst ever told you anything over the years, or have you witnessed anything over the years? Not what you just assumed, but that leads you to that conclusion. Only being invited to Bob's apartment when Stuart or Stuart and Ellen were already visiting. Can you tell me, um, when Susan Giordano 
has talked to you, did she ever refer to Stuart Altman as a character witness for Bob? Yes. Do you recall Susie Giordano uh, telling you that um, they want to use Doug Oliver and Stuart Altman as character witnesses? Yes, I do recall that. Did you ever meet uh, Morris Black? No. And is it fair to say that the only time you ever became aware of Morris Black was after uh, everything occurred in Galveston? Yes, that's fair to say. Have you ever talked to Bob Durst about Morris Black's death? I'm thinking. No. Have you ever told investigators in this case that you made a conscious decision not to ask Mr. Durst about Morris Black's death? No, I don't recall that. Do you recall ever telling detectives that you did not want to ask Mr. Durst about Morris Black's death because you wanted to save your questions for Susan Berman? No, I don't recall that at all. Let me ask you. Does it make sense? All right, I'll continue. When I say the name Miriam Barnes, and that's M-I-R-I-A-M, do you know who that is? Yes, casually. And who is Miriam Barnes? I believe, I believe she was a neighbor at Beekman, at the Beekman address of Susan Berman's, and I believe I just met her through Susan who's been passing. And when you, can you spell Beekman for me? B E E K M A N. Is that a place in New York City yes. where Susan lived in the, uh, what period of time? Yes, I think it was 30 people, people in place. That would have been from the time she, I knew her coming to New York to the time she moved to California. It's going to be late 70s, early 80s? Yes. And when you said that you knew Mary Barnes as a friend of Susan's, do you recall any more details of how Susan and Miriam uh, were involved? No, just that they were friends and neighbors. So your memory is that Miriam Barnes also was a resident of Beekman Place? Yeah, unless I, unless for some reason I formally had an erroneous memory. Based on your memory, was <clears throat> Miriam Barnes, was she a close friend of Susan's from what you knew and observed? When Susan had a female friend that usually was a close friend, I think she was close. Have you ever had a conversation with Miriam Barnes about Kathy Durst? No. something and ask to refresh your recollection. This is going to be NC-185. You know, I'm just pointing this out because um, it might never happen again, and so uh, I want to get pointed while I can. I told Mr. Gaguerre and I would be 45 minutes today. He expressed reasonable um, skepticism at that estimate. Um, I'm going to be, I am almost done. So I just want to throw that out. There'll be many times when I, I underestimate how much time? So I wanted to get my credit for. for time. Okay, I thought it was forty-five lawyer minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is going to be your honor. Uh, Ten thirty fifteen interview. Okay. This is going to be um, LAPA Bates one four eight seven two nine, page thirty nine, lines five through nineteen. I want you to listen as I'd asked you before. Um, the question about. Um, had you asked, oh sure, Bob, if it's going to be uh, page 39. I'd asked you a few moments ago whether or not you had deliberately decided not to ask Bob questions about Morris Black. Do you remember that? Remember the question I just asked you? Yeah, I remember the question you asked me. Yes. I want you to listen to this. Let's go back to. Let's go back to, uh, real quick, did, did Bob ever mention anything to you? So you know 
what he said about Morris. He said that it was self-defense. Right. Did you ever ask him, or did he ever mention anything to you about it? That wasn't subject we ever talked about it, Morris Black. So, did you ever ask him? And I would assume that is the reason... I didn't know the guy, and I didn't have anything to do with it. It wasn't like Kathy or Susan. Well, you were going to save your questions for the two ones that you really care about. Absolutely. Does that refresh your memory at all? Does that refresh your memory at all? Yes, but I don't know what is different about that from what I said. So, I asked you a moment ago if you had... One moment. I asked you a moment ago if you deliberately did not ask Mr. Durst any questions about Morris Black because you wanted to save your questions for... I had asked about Susan, but for Kathy or Susan, and you had said, I believe you answered no, that you did not remember that. In that clip right there, when I asked you, were you going to save your questions for the two ones that you really care about, and your answer was absolutely. So, I'm just asking... When you asked me a few minutes ago, I thought you were just asking me if I talked about Morris Black, not anything about saving it for questions of Kathy. I never heard that. The first time that we spoke to you was April 6, 2015. Yes. And is it fair to say that we spoke to you approximately five to ten more times before you ended up telling us the full truth of what you knew? Yes. On October 30, 2015, is that when you represented to us that you were now telling us the full truth of what you knew? I believe so, but I want to qualify by saying that that's approximately seven months after we first talked, yes. Just in my last area here, overall, how have myself and the detectives from the Los Angeles Police Department and my partners, how have we treated you? You've treated me with sensitivity, with understanding that I really had never expected from a prosecutor. From the start, the first time we talked, has there been one overriding thing that we've asked you to do? Yes. What is that? Just tell the truth. If I were to ask you how easy was it for you to tell us the whole truth? Well, I think the metaphor, like ripping off a bandage, was probably, it was difficult. In the end, Mr. Chapin, what was it that compelled you to finally tell everything that you knew about Robert Durst's involvement in Susan Burton's murder? In the end, you made the decision to tell us the full extent you've said of what you knew about Robert Durst's involvement in Susan Burton's murder. Is that right? Yes. What was it that finally caused you to do that? Actually, it was a memory of my childhood with my father, who was an attorney, and he was explaining to me that the whole truth meant if a child's mother says, did Johnny break his arm and he broke his leg, and you say, no, he didn't, that that was not the whole truth. I wasn't telling the whole truth by not explaining what had happened. Did that metaphor make sense? I want you, Mr. Chapin, if you can, to in the end explain, did you have to balance competing interests in this case and how you did so? Yes, I felt that I had to consider my obligation to Susan and Susan's memory and my obligation to my other friend, Bob, and I felt the seriousness of what happened with Susan outweighed my current friendship or loyalty to Bob Durst, and I felt it was more important 
to be entirely truthful and say everything I did. Did Susan's words to you that you said she had repeated often, um, in essence, Kathy's dead, we can't do anything about that, we have to help Bob, are those words that you've thought about many times over the years? Yes. So, what, well, I'd like you to explain your feelings when contemplating what Susan said to you about Kathy. I thought about it often, and there was another thing she said, which was when I challenged her and said, how do you know? And she said, because he told me. That, for me, was just proof incontrovertible that but that's how she knew it. I mean, I thought about the fact that Susan's memory is, in this ironically, is living, and I had a duty to protect it, just like she claimed we had a duty to protect Bob. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Buchanan, will you be back in the cross-examination? I will, Your Honor.
Is that a question? Is that correct? Is that the first, is that the time, Frank? From April of 2015, maybe 10 uh, different conversations, correct? Seems correct, yes. And you, uh, you claim that this happened at a supper or dinner that you had with <coughs> in Manhattan. Yes. Or in Harlem. Yes. And uh, for those who may not be familiar with the various boroughs, uh, Harlem is kind of north of Manhattan, right? But on the south of Manhattan Island. Yes. <coughs> You uh, claim that it, the dinner happened at uh, a restaurant on 120th Street and Lenox Avenue, correct? Approximately. Uh, have you been back to that location just to check to see that that's where it was? No, I haven't. Uh, and you uh, have said to Mr. Lewin and the investigators that that restaurant was called Barrow Wine, B-A-R-A-W-I-N-E, correct? That, what, I didn't know that for certain, that was what I thought. Let's see, uh, our exhibit uh, three R's, from, this is an email, can you see that uh, email? Can you mind just giving us the Bates on the bottom, on the bottom left, the little number that says LGA? 148663? That's it. I get a 2020 vision? That's an email you sent to uh, uh, Mr. Lewin in January of 2016. Is it? If the data is correct, yeah. Okay, and you, uh, what the email says is, Hello, John, hope all is well with you. Here is what I am 85% sure is the restaurant where Bob and I ate when he spoke with me on the street, Barrowine, 200 Lenox Avenue, corner of 120, Harlem, New York. Nick, I read that correctly? Yes, you did. That's, you sent that. I said I was 85%. Yes, you sent that, didn't you? I wrote that, yes. And you sent it? I wrote it. Okay, you wrote it. Did you send it? Oh, send it. I thought you were saying, did you say it? Yeah, I sent it. Sorry. Uh, are you a little hard of hearing? No, I think it's your accent. <laughs> Deep <laughs> Southern draw. Tell us you're on Texas. Yeah. I am, but I don't talk that way. <laughs> okay. So you were at least certain enough about it to send the name of the restaurant to Mr. Lewin that you claimed that this happened? Yes, after looking it up on Google Maps and the tiny script looking at it, I certainly could be wrong about the spelling or the address. Okay, well let's, let's take a look at there one, uh, uh, 5L, uh, it's L -L 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 -L. Mm -hmm. Is that the restaurant, the one that's on the screen? You know, if it's night, and I can't actually tell for sure. Yeah, it's a picture of a restaurant. Bear Wine. So there's a picture of on the screen of Bear Wine Restaurant at Lenox Avenue and 120. Is that the restaurant where you claim? It's the, it's the Something's going on with that court system. I can't be sure because there's seating outside <clears throat> that wasn't when I was there. And uh, from appearance, I can't be sure. <coughs> All right. Um, well, you're 85% sure, is that right? I'm not 85% sure that that is the same as what I wrote about in my email. Can you? Read the, the address that's on the picture? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't lit up, and there wasn't a seating outside. It just, I can't be sure that that's the same. Well, is that the same one that you put in your email? 
I put in my email what I thought was the address and the spelling. Both could have been wrong. Clearly, the spelling was wrong, right? Let's look at the email again. Uh, triple R. <coughs> Same spelling? Yes. Same address? Yes. Okay. Same spelling, same address. That's what you sent uh, to. Well, that's Mr. associated Lewin. my. Just a moment, please. That's what you sent to Mr. Lewin. Sent, S E N T, mm -hmm. uh, to Mr. Lewin. That is what I sent, yes. All right. Uh, now, you know enough about New York to know that uh, there are people on the street all the time, at all hours of the day and night, don't you? Some streets, yes. And the corner of Lenox and 120th is a busy corner, isn't it? I don't know that to be so. Has it been your experience that it's a busy corner? You were there. You I have know. never been there before, and it wasn't busy when I was there. And there wasn't outdoor seating, and there weren't people there. Because if there had been a lot of people there, doesn't it make, uh, make it seem kind of uh, unusual that Mr. Durst would confess to you a busy street corner by a busy restaurant? Not at a cafe. That's a cafe, a sidewalk cafe. The yes. seating is that. The seating was not that when we were there. Okay, so let's uh, take turns. So if you'll pause. Uh, wait, listen to the question, pause, take a breath, and answer. That's your answer. Yes. Right. It's seven months between April when you first talked to him and October when you came up with the story. We can agree it's seven months, Kate. Not that I came up with the story. That makes it sound like I just came up with it. It was seven yes, months since I, I said it. I intended it to sound that way. It took seven months for you to come up with the story that you told the prosecutors about Bob Durst confessing to you, didn't it? No. Did you tell them that during that seven months until October or not? Came up with it suggests that I thought of it seven months later. Yes, it does. Well, that's not the case. Well, that was the first time you told them. Uh, not, isn't so for, it? The there's first a time. million things a minute, that I haven't said to them. Ask the witness to me. I didn't ever come up with the story. It occurred a long time before. It occurred. It was never mentioned to the prosecutors when I first spoke with them. I deliberated for many, many months on what I wanted to say and in lieu of what I knew. And it was only then that I decided to talk about it. Well, then no one came up with. It. Well, let's, let's see what we can agree on, uh, Mr. Chavin. Uh, you first told the story to the prosecutors on October the 30th. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you did not tell them that story in many conversations with them between April of 2015 and October the 30th of 2015 when you finally told them the story. That's that great. Do you want to repeat that? No, I don't want to. I lost track of it. Sorry. Okay, we have the court reporter. And you did not tell them that story in many, in many conversations with them between April 2015 and October the 30th of 2015 when you finally told them the story. Yes. That's correct, isn't it? It seems correct, yes. Okay. In fact, you even told them that it was untrue that Bob had confessed to you. Did you? I don't recall when you're talking about that I said Bob didn't confess. Well, uh, for instance, on April the 7th, the very next day after the phone, first uh, time you talked to the prosecutors, you said that Bob didn't tell you anything, didn't you? Well, did I, did he tell me anything? Yes. Well, 
Okay, let's see that confess you. All right, give it uh, triple C. Okay. Yeah. April the seventh. Page five. you 
had in mind what Bob's, what you claim Bob said to you? And your answer was yes. Well, my answer is I don't know. So you don't know whether you uh, had in your mind what you were going to claim that Bob said? At the time, April the 7th, when you talked to the district attorney's office? I'm not clear about what I had in mind. But at any rate, you, you do not deny those were your words. I can't really put together what it was. Well, they appear to be my words. <clears throat> well, let's move on. Um, <coughs> clearly, it's your position uh, in your testimony that uh, Mr. Durst on October, excuse me, on whatever the date was at Barrowline, confessed to you by saying it was her or me, I had no choice. That's, that's what you're saying today. And yes. Right? Yes. <clears throat> and uh, did you just not remember it at the time of April the 7th, 15, when you gave this, this interview? Is that what you meant by I'm trying to put it together? I wasn't prepared to get specific then, and I didn't know how to say that. I felt strange saying I'm not going to tell you. Well, let's go on a little bit. Uh, let's see page 19, please, the same transcript. This is our triple C. Uh, it's uh, April the 7th, 15. I'll read it to you. This is uh, D is uh, stands for Deputy District Attorney Lewin, and the C, of course, is you. All right, so here's what I'm thinking. Well, let me ask this question right now. If Bob has confessed to you, if Bob had said, hey, listen, I killed Susan. Would you tell me right now? You said yes. I would tell you, yeah. You didn't say I'm reluctant or I'm waiting or anything. You said you, you would tell, right? Yes, but those were the words. A logical break, and, and though we haven't gone that long, our reporters have. So uh, I, I am going to take a, a shorter break, a 10 minute break, I think, uh, will satisfy everybody. Is that all right with you? 10, okay. <clears throat> do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. 1040 will return. <laughs> 